Hi there, I'm Dr. Paul Grisby from the Department of Classics and Ancient History at the University of Warwick. I just want to welcome you to our Ancient Feasting Day. One important type of feast that we find in the ancient world, especially in the ancient Greek world, is the idea of feasting with the gods. What I want to talk about today is how this feasting with the gods was imagined in reality and mythologically, and how the latter was often a source of misunderstanding between men and the gods. I also want to talk about a less savoury form of feasting in Greek mythology, and that's the idea of the Thyestean feast, which I'll explain in due course. When we think about how the Greeks and the Romans related to their gods, the most important form of communication between men and gods was through sacrifice. And one way of imagining sacrifice was as a shared feast between men and gods. In the Greek world, a sacrificed animal was often cooked and eaten with the gods getting their own share, which luckily for the Greeks was made up of the bits they didn't really want to eat. This is the thigh bones and fat and stuff like that, with the Greeks getting the good bits, the meat. The story of how this neat but, but uneven separation took place into the Greeks good portion and the gods inedible portion is found in a poem called the Theogony or the Origin of the Gods by the Greek poet Hesiod written in around the sort of 9th or 8th century BC. Here the titan Prometheus tricks Zeus into choosing the fattened bones for the gods portion though of course Zeus knows everything he knows he's being tricked but takes one for the team anyway. This story of the trick and the bad feeling it engendered between men and the gods for this and other misdemeanors, Prometheus ended up chained to a mountain with an eagle eternally tearing out his liver. Doesn't really sum up the real feelings expressed in sacrifice and how the Greeks actually saw it, which rather than emphasizing the distance between men and gods was in fact a means of bridging them, that gap and coming together. The emphasis is one of a shared feast rather than a divide. In festivals such as the Olympic Games or the Panathenaic at Athens, for example, sometimes hundreds of oxen were slaughtered and sacrificed with enough meat produced to feed the entire citizenry of Athens, while also pleasing the recipient of the sacrifice, Athena, with her portion of bones and fat as well. While this might give the impression of sacrifice as an excuse for a big barbecue, we need to remember that in some sacrifices, Holocaust for example, the whole animal was burnt and men got nothing. In time, massive mounds of ash were created from these sacrificed animals. At Olympia in the 2nd century AD, the Greek traveller Pausanias reported seeing an ash altar 22 feet high, evidence of hundreds of years of shared feasting between the people at Olympia and the god Zeus Olympios. Such sacrifices hark back to the idea that in the not so distant past, men and gods actually feasted together face to face. Examples in mythology include the wedding of Cadmus and Harmony in Thebes, attended by the gods, and later still, just before the Trojan War, the wedding of Peleus and Thetis, the father and mother of the Greek hero Achilles, which again was a big party between mortals and immortals, as captured here in the Sophilos Dinos, a large mixing cup now housed in the British Museum. The cup shows gods and goddesses and other types of divinities such as the nymphs, muses, Chiron the centaur, arriving to enjoy the wedding feast of the mortals Peleus and his divine wife, the sea goddess Thetis. They're all bringing gifts, Dionysus is bringing some bunches of grapes for wine, and Peleus welcomes them at the door with a raised cup. We know that the gods liked a good feast. In Book 1 of Homer's Iliad, the Greek hero Achilles, having been insulted by the Greek king Agamemnon, asks his mother Thetis to turn to Zeus to help. She promises to, but she can't do it quite yet because Zeus is off feasting with the Ethiopians. As she says, But remain by your swift seafaring ships, and continue your wrath against the Achaeans, and refrain utterly from battle, for Zeus went yesterday to Oceanus, to the blameless Ethiopians, for a feast, and all the gods followed him, but on the twelfth day he will come back again to Olympus, and then will I go to the house of Zeus, with threshold of bronze, and will clasp his knees in prayer, and I think I shall win him over. So not only did the gods like feasting with the mortals, but these banquets could often last a very long time. We don't hear otherwise, so presumably this feast with the Ethiopians went well, but in mythology, such collective feats often went wrong or ended in disaster. The reason for this might well be that these stories were told to explain why the gods no longer were actually here on earth eating with us, but were now distant and far away. Two examples spring to mind, those of Tantalus and his son Pelops, and that of Lycaon. Tantalus, a king of the area later called Lydia in Asia Minor, modern Turkey, was said to have invited the gods to a feast and for some unfathomable reason thought it would be a good idea to cook and serve up his own son Pelops. The gods recognised the meat on the plate and refused to eat, but the goddess Demeter, grieving for her lost daughter Persephone, 
was distracted and ate Pelops' shoulder. After this, the gods bowled the boy back to life in a cauldron, perhaps to replace his lost shoulder, which Demeter had eaten with an ivory shoulder blade. Tantalus was sent to the underworld for this, to be eternally punished with incessant thirst and hunger. He was surrounded by food and drink, being placed in a pool of water with a fruit tree overhanging, but whenever he tried to reach for either the water or the fruit, they would move away. Hence the origin of the word to tantalize. We know this story is very early because Odysseus relates having seen Tantalus being punished in the underworld in the episode of Book 11 in Homer's Odyssey from about the 8th century BC. Here's what he has to say. Yes, and I saw Tantalus in bitter torment, standing in a pool, and the water came close to his chin. He was wild with thirst, but had no way to drink. For as often as the old man stooped down, eager to drink, so often would the water be swallowed up and vanish away. And at his feet the black earth would appear, for some god would dry it all up. And trees high and leafy let hang their fruits from their tops, pears and pomegranates and apple trees with their bright fruit, and sweet figs and luxuriant olives. But as often as the old man would reach out towards these to clutch them with his hands, the wind would toss them to the shadowy clouds. In a similar fashion, in Arcadia, a man named Lycaon tested Zeus by <laughs> roasting his own son Nyctimus and serving him up to Zeus to see if he'd notice. In response, Zeus, who did notice, turned Lycaon into a wolf and killed all his other children, but it restored Nyctimus to life. I ought to mention that the cooking and eating of children was a popular feature of Greek myth and even Greek history, if you believe some. In mythology, the father of the Greek king Agamemnon, a man named Atreus, punished his brother Thyestes for sleeping with Atreus' wife, and he did this by cooking up Thyestes' children, so Atreus' own nieces and nephews. He put them into a pie. Once Thyestes had eaten the pie, Atreus showed him his children's hands and heads, which he had kept aside for the big reveal. This is the origin of the phrase Thyestean feast, which is given to any sort of horrific act, especially acts of this nature. And it happens a surprising amount in Greek mythology and in history if people like Herodotus um, are to be believed, which they probably shouldn't. In my favourite example, Herodotus tells us that Astyages, the king of the Medes or the Medians, had a dream that his own daughter Mandane would give birth to a king who would overthrow him. So he ordered his general Harpagus to expose a child at birth. Harpagus was reluctant to spill royal blood, so he gave the child to a shepherd, as they normally do in these cases, and the boy grew up to be Cyrus the Great of Persia. We learn of what Astyages did when he found out that Cyrus was still alive. He forgave Harpagus and invited him to dinner the next day, and as Herodotus continues, When Harpagus heard this, he did obeisance and went home, greatly pleased to find that his offence had served the needful end, and that he was invited to dinner in honour of his fortunate day. Coming in, he bade his only son, a boy of about 13 years of age, to go to Astyga's palace and do whatever the king commanded. And in his great joy, he told his wife all that had happened. But when Harpagus' son came, Astyga cut his throat and tearing him limb from limb, roasted and boiled some of his flesh. And the work being finished, kept all in readiness. So when it came to the hour for dinner and Harpagus was present among the rest of his guests, dishes of, of sheep's flesh were set before Astyga's and the others. But Harpagus was served with the flesh of his own son, all but the head and hands and feet, which lay apart, covered up in a basket. And when Harpagus seemed to have eaten his fill, Astyagus asked him, Are you pleased with your meal, Harpagus? Exceedingly well pleased, Harpagus answered. Then those whose business it was brought him in the covered basket, the heads and hands and feet of his son. And they stood before Harpagus and bade him uncover and take of them what he would. Harpagus did so. He uncovered and saw what was left of his son. This he saw, but he mastered himself and was not dismayed. Astyagus asked him, Know you what beast's flesh you have eaten? Yes, he said, I know, and all that the king does is pleasing to me. With that answer, he took the rest of the flesh and went to his house, proposing then, as I supposed, to collect and bury all. Returning finally to more savoury matters, there was a specific type of ritual called the Theoxenia, which means feasting with the gods or having the gods as guests. Where actual couches were put out for the gods with plates of food, and as if the gods could actually come down or up and be present with the humans to feast. This was particularly true of the rite for dead heroes, beings who were imagined to have godlike powers and were immortal but of human or half-human stock. We can see images of what was imagined when gods or heroes dined with humans from various carved votives, such as this one here. 
Once again, this is a final reminder that the offerings to the gods or heroes should be seen, at least in part, as something of a shared communal feast, and a reminder that despite some mishaps and unfortunate feasts along the way, it was still the most important thing you could do to share your feast with the gods every now and then in the form of sacrifice or by setting out a couch and leaving out some food for them, like you might do a mince pie for Father Christmas and a carrot for Rudolph, but it was probably best to leave your children out of the pies. Thank you. Oh, so.